Good morning, church. It's a good start to your week, anyway. That's great. So, Nehemiah chapter 5. And I suppose this part of the, of the Bible is, is where the holy confrontation starts. Um, and things are seen for what they are. And some stuff has to be rooted out. Um, Nehemiah, I suppose, is, is, is such an appropriate book for us at the moment with the changes that we've had in church so far. We're after moving from the Keys over to here. And we've got teams after being set up. I mean, you look around you this morning, you see all the stuff after being set up and ready for road. And we come in and get our coffees and we sit down. And the amount of work that goes in, and believe me, I know I was here last week. But at least it's only once every six weeks. And we were, the teams organized, have been organized into to, to six teams so that you don't have to do too much. And, and the building progresses. The word of God progresses. Everything progresses. The worship progresses. And it's organized. And up to this point in Nehemiah chapter 5 is the same thing. And if I was to go through um, a brief synopsis, it would be as follows. Nehemiah, the meaning of it is the comforter of God. A very appropriate name for this man. And we can see why the book unfolds. So we've already gone through the first four chapters. And we see how the story of Jerusalem and its people have unfolded so far. And now we're about to give a brief synopsis of that and, and then move on to, to chapter 5. And before we do that, we just pray. So, Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your provision to us, Father, for all the goodness that comes from your hand. We thank you for providing this building, Lord God, and for the laborers that come in and do the work before we start. And for everyone who takes any bit of part in it, Father God, we just thank you for them. For the visitors that are here today, we thank you for them. And we pray that you open each and every one of our hearts, Lord God. I pray that your word will bring light into our lives, our encouragement into our souls as we need. Nothing that we say will make a bit of a difference, Lord God. But if you stand over it, well, then that makes all the difference. And so we ask for your help and your protection today. We ask for your encouragement, and we pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us as we go through the word of Nehemiah. Amen. So chapter 1. Nehemiah gets a report back about his beloved Jerusalem. While he's still serving as the, the, the king's cupbearer. So he's heartbroken and he's mourning. He spends the next four months in prayer and fasting and he's seeking God's help in finding a solution. That's, that's a lot of prayer and fasting, but he, he knows there's only one answer to this and it's through God. Chapter 2. Here we see King... I wish his name was John, but it's not. <laughs> King Artaxerxes. Uh, bear with me. I don't mention that too much. Uh, he inquires from Nehemiah as to why his countenance is so down and sad. And when Nehemiah tells the king what's wrong, he looks favorably on Nehemiah's request after four months of prayer and fasting. Um, and he tells the king what's wrong. So his request is looked upon favorably, and God grants Nehemiah's wish. So God has softened Nehemiah's heart and he's granted, or the king's heart, and he's, he's granted Nehemiah his wish. He also gives Nehemiah all the resources he needs to return and work in safety. Letters of safety, letters of approval, letters for this and for that, all stamped by the king. So there's a great start going on here. Um, the next is the building project. So the building project begins and there's great momentum after building up here and there's 41 separate teams and they're all set to work throughout the city. Now, when Nehemiah arrives first, the city is a crumbly mess. And he looks around and says, he's not even a builder. And he's looking at this and says, what are we going to do here? But because God was with them up to this point and helping them and encouraged them, they were able to put 41 teams in place. And hope is beginning to rise that maybe, just maybe, the job can get done. So chapter 4, this is getting better and better all the time. It's great. The people keep on building no matter what Satan throws at them. And there's no stopping God's people now. When things get really tough, they work with a sword in one hand and a work tool in the other hand. Remember Pastor Mike last Sunday with the, the trowel and the spear? and They were, they were still working on. Um, so things are tough, but they're working on. The people, they're threatened by the likes of Sanballat and Tobiah and all their armies. But God brings their murderous threats to nothing. They persevere and nothing will stop God's people as they continue to build the ruins. This is all looking so good, and it can only get better in chapter 5. It has to get better because God, the momentum, the whole lot, and chapter 5 starts with a huge crash. Bang, stop. It's all stopped here, and this is why it's after happening. So you go back into the first five verses in Nehemiah, 
And it says, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brethren. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, We, must mor- we are mortgaging our fields and vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, We have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as their sons, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. So, now we get a gist of why this is after crashing, why this is after stopping. The great outcry is, amongst the common people, they're crying out against internal wrongdoings by their own brethren against their own brethren. The people are in great distress and they bring their complaint to Nehemiah. But, and this is the big but, the really big problem doesn't lie outside the walls with the army surrounding them and with every one of their murderous threats and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and the whole lot of people. It's, it's not them, it's inside. What's inside the walls is what's destroying the people of God. They can deal with the threat of their lives from the outside but the abuse dished out by their own brethren is too much to stomach. The common people are totally oppressed. And here God shows Nehemiah, a spiritual man who has himself cried out to God for months and months and months to help his people, what the real problem is. And God has shown him, this we must get right first. We see that some of the people are crying out in hunger as they have nothing to eat, nothing to feed their families with. They need grain to eat and, and to live. Other people have mortgaged their houses, their lands, their vineyards in order to avoid starvation during this famine. The next group of people, they've borrowed money for food and because of this debt, their children are enslaved and have nothing to buy their freedom with. They're powerless as they see their families being destroyed before their very eyes. Just take a picture for yourself. Take a picture for yourself, your own family. What would it feel like? So you, you get a gist of what these people are feeling. What can be done to sort out this huge calamity? Ah, how the pagan world has treated the children of God so cruelly. Well, you could be forgiven for thinking that when you read how badly they've been treated. And there's just one small problem. And that's this fourth group of people. And they're those who are living off the backs of the first three groups. And they're also their Jewish brethren. The nobles and the rulers amongst God's people. They've taken advantage of their own people. They've fattened their own bank balances on the backs of their own people's hardships all because they started off a little bit higher than them. They've broken God's laws, they've destroyed their brethren's lives and their families, all because of their greed, and as a result, their faith in God has diminished because they don't see justice. And Proverbs 14, come on, clicker. Oh, got it. Proverbs 14, 31 says it very well. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honours God. These people have lost their fear of God. And so, they can easily justify their transgressions with little excuses here and there. And they've made a choice. They choose wealth over God's favour. They've spent a lot of time in hardship and different conditions. And I suppose they're saying, oh, now's a chance to jump on somebody else's back and make a little bit for myself. And they've gone down that road. So in my opinion... God's refusing to go one step further until this injustice is dragged out into the open and dealt with. God doesn't go easy on sin. And the rebuilding of Jerusalem can't go ahead. Not one more step until this horrible injustice is dealt with. God's people were being mocked by the surrounding nations who oppressed them because they knew what was happening inside the walls. They knew what was happening amongst God's people. And more importantly, God knew what was happening. They're being ridiculed by the likes of Sambalus and Tobiah and their armies. They're facing fierce opposition. But what was happening inside the walls was rotten to the core. And it had to be dealt with, and it had to be dealt with now if this project was going to be carried out to completion. There had to be a cleansing. And God was telling the people that, yes, he wanted to use all his people to restore his city, but he would not use them in their current condition. And there had to be a purification of the heart. And the heart was just like the walls of Jerusalem at the time. It was going to have to be rebuilt. It was going to have to be made new. 
It was going to have to be strong, and it was going to have to be fortified, and it was God was going to have to be in charge of the work. And this is what God was telling Nehemiah that it was going to have to happen. And we see it every day of every week. We see it in our own lives. We see it in our churches. You can take an example of any church you want, and you see what happens when we fail to follow God honorably. It looks okay on the outside. It looks good. It'll work away. It'll go from step to step to step, and we can all play the game. But on the inside, it falls asunder. It falls down. It crumbles. And at the end of the day, the people see no God in the house, and they leave. They leave and they go elsewhere, or they go nowhere, because they feel hurt, rejected, despised by their own. You see it in the Catholic Church. You see it in the and what happened down through the, the years there was the different um, things that sort of went on, the, 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 um, the scandals that occurred. You see it in Christian churches. We can't put ourselves aside and say, oh, well, it doesn't happen with us. But it does. It happens everywhere. And God is telling us, you protect your heart and you look to me and I will keep you on a straight and narrow path. Don't go left, don't go right. Don't look at money, don't look at finances, don't look at affairs and different things that happen. Keep straight with me and I'll keep straight with you. I'll keep your path simple, but you stay with me. So, we have all these examples. I can go back to an occasion myself and I'll never forget it. My poor brother was an insurance sales rep. After leaving uh, secondary school and he was go out and it was a hard job. He had to try and sell his insurance. So he was go out and try and sell it. And I'll never forget he had a black briefcase and in the society, he used to keep all his, his money that he made from new claims and different things. I was 12 or 13 years of age, and of course, I was a fantastic dipper. <laughs> so, my poor brother was out collecting the finances and trying to, to make a living, and of course, Marky was um, bits and pieces here and there. And I never, ever forget it. My brother, my brother used to ask me scratch, he says, I, I just can't make a go of this. I don't know why. I just can't make a go of this. I think my sales are up, but they never seem to, <laughs> seem to go anywhere. And of course, yeah, oh well, silly old job anyway, but... And it was when I became a Christian after, I'll never forget it. It, it just niggled the back of my mind so much, and it got worse and worse. And it was like a, a... Do you remember Woody Woodpecker? Remember the young for the cartoon? He, it was just banging away at my head. And I knew my faith and my walk with God wasn't going to go one step further until I sorted this out. And so it was only a phone call after. And just to say to him, look, this is what happened, I'm sorry. And make restoration. And of course, he was like, ah, forget about that, that's years ago. And it was very little to him because he moved on. The but it was killing me. It was killing me. And uh, it's just my example of, of what you have to be right with God. Because God is great. He'll bring it to your mind. He's going to let you know. And he's going to make you step up. And he's going to make it count. So you have two choices. Like you can have your head bashed out, or you can get it right. We know what to do. We're all, most of us are here on a long walk. We've been here a good while. We just, we know what to do. We just need to do it. So now God's people are saying that we are the same flesh and blood, but we're being treated so unfairly by our brothers, and they're calling for justice. So Nehemiah hears the accusations. He ponders them. He thinks these accusations over, but he doesn't jump straight in. While you could be angry and determined to sort this out now straight away. Because it's his own people abusing his own people, and he gets very he, he gets angry over it, but he doesn't jump straight in. So when the time is right and he's taught about it all, when he's and he's taught it over, he brings the accusations to the nobles and uh, the rulers themselves. And the accusations are brought in righteous anger. And you can consider the actions in John 2, verse 3 to 16 of Jesus. There it is. Point it back where? Huh? All right, I'm pointing it up. <laughs> and yeah. So in the temple, Jesus, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money and, and, and sitting there. Um, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the, the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. So basically, Jesus was so angry at what was happening in his father's house. But, and he was able to control that anger just to, to rid it of what was wrong inside her. But 
He didn't go in and start beating people or anything like that. He just, he just cleared the house out of what was wrong. And so Nehemiah does this. He chews it over a little bit and he thinks about it and, and then he, he brings it to people. So he doesn't sing it, sin. It's a righteous anger. I mean, Jesus often saw wrongs being committed and he righteously brought attention to the wrongs being committed against his father's house and his people. Jesus has always stood for what is right and he always... He was always swift in bringing it to our attention so it can be dealt with. And we all know it. We all know it in our own lives. If we're doing something wrong to, any, to someone else, the Lord will bring it to us. Ecclesiastes 7.9 tells us. <laughs> so that tells us, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in, the, resides in the lap of fools. So Nehemiah, in the next couple of verses, uh, verses 7 to 13, and I know we've, we've read them already, but I just think it's good just to go back over them again so we know where we're, we're staying with this. Um, I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you're exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. And now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what, are you, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves and houses, and also the usury you are charging them, the hundredth part of the money, the grain, the new wine and the oil. And they said, we will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. And then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of his house and possessions every man who does not keep this promise. So may such a man be shaken out and emptied. So, so Nehemiah thinks things over and he comes to his decision. He knows that all the people must be of one heart, one mind, one spirit to do this one job. The same in our own lives goes for our marriages, our friendships. You know, when you feel wronged or insulted at times, and to jump in there straight away and win an argument isn't worth much if, you're going to, if it's at the cost of your friendship. And I think it's a good example of just standing back a little bit. Patient, patient assessment always wins. So in these next verses, what does Nehemiah do? He rebukes all that's wrong, and he calls it as it is. He's not afraid of the seniority of these guys or their power. Nehemiah knows there's too much at stake here, so he goes straight to the heart of the problem, and he calls it out. God's people are taking advantage of God's people. There's abuse of power by the nobles and rulers, total disregard for the fellow countrymen's current conditions, and profiteering. It's a heart problem. Many years previously, these people's predecessors were freed from slavery and led out of Egypt by God himself. And here they are now, enslaving their own brethren, despite the laws that were, they were commanded to keep in order to live in peace with God and with each other. Jews being charged interest rates on loans by Jews is completely against God's law. They were allowed to charge Gentiles interest, but not each other. And Exodus 22, 25 tells us. In one second. Anyway, Exodus 22, 25 tells us. If you lend any money to my people with you who are poor, you will not be like a money lender to him, and you will not exact interest. So it's just one of the examples of the conditions of the rulers and the nobles' hearts. They've disregarded God's law in order to benefit themselves at the cost of God's people. God wants unity and honesty amongst these people, regardless of, the, of their position. He wants us to be a holy and loving to one another. And in doing so, we can be an example of goodness and love to the outside world. Our flesh is always shouting, more for me. I want more. But Jesus tells us, no, you're mine now. You're mine now. 
so you will do unto others as you would have dimmed one to you. And that's our example, that we must do unto others as we would have dimmed one to us. That's what God wants of us. This along with the fact that some of the people have been sold into slavery because their death shows what a slippery slide these guys are sitting on. And this is a similar effect, and uh, something like a huge boulder that's just tipped off the side of a hill, and it goes, 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 and it goes faster, 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 and all the way down, all it does is cause destruction. And the faster it goes, the more destruction is caused, and there's no stop in it. So after Nehemiah brings his accus accusations to the nobles and the rulers, he calls a great assembly and brings all the people together. He declares how God has redeemed the Jewish brethren who were sold to the pagan nations only for the Jews to do the exact same thing now with their own brothers and sisters. In front of all the people of Jerusalem, he accuses the rulers and the nobles of this great crime and he openly declares it before all the people and he calls it for what it is. It is wrong. He tells the oppressors to fear God because of the reproach of their enemies. Nehemiah makes the hard call and calls the offence for what it is. Nehemiah fears God more than men, and he loves God, and he doesn't want God's name to be tainted as a result of the action of sinful men. He demands that it stops right now before disaster occurs, and he calls for immediate repentance, and he wants God's house to be put back in order from the inside out before another brick is laid in the wall of Jerusalem. He hates the fact that God's name is being so heavily tarnished by his own people's actions. Nehemiah sets himself up as an example of lending without interest and he pleads for this to be done across the board. The Old and New Testament are very similar as far as they all show how to treat people in a Christ-like way. Not abusing our power or our position over those who are less fortunate than ourselves but treating them as brothers and sisters as is fitting in our Father's eyes. Christ's character is full of love and kindness and Nehemiah demands that his less fortunate brethren are treated in this Christ-like way. I'm going to keep going. Ephesians 6 verse 9 tells us, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is their master and your master is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. May it be a great warning to all of us that be careful how we deal with God's children because not only are we children of God, so are the people we're, we're dealing with. There's a huge demand here for respect across the board. So Nehemiah calls for rest, restitution. He says, give back what you've taken. You've taken the lands, the vineyards, the olive groves, the houses, also the 1% of the, uh, the interest that's been charged to the people on their loans. It doesn't sound like a whole pile. 1%, that's all right, 1%, but it's a monthly interest. So that monthly interest of 1% when compounded is 12% over the year. Uh, and this is continue, continuously added to the previous balance. So we are, well, some of us more than others know how this feels. And it goes on and on and on and up and up and up. Um, and so basically it becomes harder and harder to pay and you get a lump sum and throw it at it. I remember myself and Lauren were married first. Young, free, easy going, life is good. A couple of Visa cards each, no problem. And you know, it was great because you didn't even have to pay the bill, you just had to pay the, the little bit at the bottom that says minimum, minimum charge. And I said, Yeah, yes, look. So, and seven or eight hundred euro, a pound at the time, you know. Um, a seven or eight hundred pound Visa bill, you're starting to pay 25, 30, it is, it is grand. But then the realization comes in pretty quickly. No, no, this isn't working because this bill is getting bigger and it's going over. And the frustration that comes in because all of a sudden you start to see that you can't, you just can't pay it. Like I mean, you're putting more into it and you, it's still not going down. And, and then you're getting angry with yourself for losing control and letting it get to that situation. And then it's, it's the frustration. And I remember like uh, myself and Lauren were saying, but none of us could sleep. I was blaming her. <laughs> she was blaming me. The conversation was going nowhere, it just really wasn't. And I said, right, and I got up, went downstairs, got the two visa cards, brought them back up and <laughs> snipped them right there. But it was a great example like, of, of, well to me it was a great example of, of, you know, how easily things can get out of control, out of your control. And, 
And, you know, we, just, we cut the cards off and we didn't spend another thing on the visa bill till we had that thing paid off. And we learnt a very le good lesson. Let's just say we learnt a very good lesson. And we learnt it very quickly as lessons go. We learnt it very, very quickly. So, let's, let, let's try and picture this. There's a great assembly called of all the people in Jerusalem. Nehemiah lays the charges against the nobles and the rulers. And the blessed thing about being a noble and a ruler is that these guys would have had the best seats at the assembly, which is befitting their status, of course. So they're to the front and all, they were to the, the back. Nothing against you, know, there's no problem. <laughs> but I, I, I've an awful feeling this is just one time. I don't want to be at the front of this if I'm a ro noble or ruler. It just, uh, you know, this isn't going to go well. So he calls out everything that's wrong amongst God's people in front of the whole assembly. They reckon at the time, um, Jerusalem was approximately, uh, what is this again, about four, yeah, 30 acres um, was, was the size of Jerusalem, and there was about 4,500 inhabitants, roughly. This is not biblical, this is um, archaeologist and historical. And it's it's a, rough, a rough estimate of what it was at the time. But even at that, I'd hate to have 4,500 pairs of eyes staring into my back when I know what I've done to them. I, I just don't think it would... Uh, you just don't feel so comfortable. And Nehemiah is tactician supreme. He's brilliant. So he calls out all that's wrong. And he's such a good tactician. And as governor, he is led by such an example. And so he calls it, and he gets everyone in to say, this is what's happened, this isn't wrong, this isn't right, and if we want to do this properly, we've got to, to move on. And the response from the nobles and the rulers is quite obvious, automatic. Yes, yes. We will restore it, and we will require nothing from them. We will do as you say, in verse 12. You see, these guys knew they were doing wrong. Didn't have to be told by Nehemiah, but I think um, the crowd behind them sort of helped them to to think, yeah, yeah, you know what, we, we might sort this out, all right. So then Nehemiah calls in the heavy hitters, and he brings the priests on board. And he gets them, and he brings them along, and he gets the nobles and the rulers to swear an oath in the presence to submit to guarantee. And he warns them that if they don't stand by it, God will deal with them severely. And any promise breaker amongst them is going to lose his house, his wealth, and his family. And the assembly shouts, Amen, and praises the Lord. So the celebration is great. The burden is lifted off the backs of God's people and they're no longer bound and enslaved. You can imagine how happy they would have felt and how free from the burden. It was a sort of a, a jubilee type day like they had in the, in the, the Old Testament where they, they freed the, um, the slaves every, every so often and they'd have a great celebration. I think it was every seven years. And there was a great celebration here because all God's people were now of one mind and the nobles and the rulers admitted their wrongdoing and they'd agreed to put it right. They had agreed to put it right before God and before each other. And so there's great the freedom, there's great hope, and there's great joy. So you can see you now the, the people's feelings are, are starting to, to gather back in again. God is becoming more real to them. They're becoming, uh, they can see an example of God in all of this, or an example of, well, it wasn't Christ, obviously, because they didn't know him, but how God would have you deal with your brethren. And Nehemiah has been put here in this position to sort this out more so than the walls of Jerusalem, in my opinion, because this has to be sorted, because you can fix all the walls in the world, but if what's inside the walls isn't, isn't operating correctly, it, it makes no difference. So they're all of one mind, they're of one spirit, and they have one goal. And they're now ready to start the rebuilding of Jerusalem. The city is ready for fortification, to be secured by God's people, working in unity and equality. They're being led by a man who's full of God's righteousness. There's no disagreement. And the nobles and the rulers agree to act immediately and agree to feed the people of their burden. So there's, this is more like the character of God. And this is what God requires of the character of these people. And he's turning them back to himself. Loving one another, acting in a Christ-like way. And, and for us today, it's, it just shows you, look, Christ first loved us and died for each one here today. And this is how souls will be won for God's kingdom throughout our lives. Let your words and your actions be testimony to all that need it. Our Saviour showed us how to do it, and we need to be busy 
doing the work that he set before us. So towards the end of Nehemiah, then, he's there for 12 years, um, led the people as governor in the land of Judah. He's an upright, honest man. He's a great example of Christ throughout the Old Testament. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer, and his qualifications were as follows. They were good qualifications. He's trustworthy, he's caring, he's prayerful, he's faithful, he's obedient, he's ordered, he's disciplined, and he's full of wisdom. He's a great example to each one of us here today. And I've no doubt Nehemiah got all those traits because of, not because of how good he was, but because of his relationship with God. And the closer and the more that he sought God, the more he obtained. It doesn't take third level qualifications or, or I don't know, anything else like that. It, 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 they're a great thing to have, don't get me wrong. Just because I don't have one doesn't mean they're not a great thing to have, and I'm not a bit jealous. <laughs> but, God doesn't, doesn't need them to make you a great person. I mean, you look at the world outside you, they have nothing. There's nothing out there. It's, it's, it's one step forward and two or three back. It's, it's painful and it's, it's impossible. I mean, ask yourself, how would you get on today if you didn't have Christ in your life? How would you walk forward if you didn't have, have Christ leading you and guide you? If you didn't have Christ to run back to and fall down at every time you made a stupid mistake or done something stupid, and we all do it all the time, can you imagine what the world, and, and I've often do it my own job, I just think back, well, I find this hard, like, how are they finding it? I mean, you're just living for weekends, and I'm lucky in the sense that I once lived for weekends as well. I'm, I worked Monday to Friday and spent my wages on everything else, Saturday and Sunday, and then you go back into mo Monday and you work Monday to Friday again, you're like a hamster going around the wheel, and waiting to get off the wheel on a Friday and break out and then back on this Monday. Oh, what a boring, miserable life. You know, we have great, great people inside in this room here today from all backgrounds. And, you know, Satan is just whispering in your ear and whittling away at you and telling you, oh, you didn't really do good, did you? You didn't really do this. You didn't really do that. You didn't really do the other. But against impossible, impossible odds, and I know them personally, some of them, they have stood up and they have taken control and charge of something that would otherwise, it would be shattered into smithereens shattered it beyond belief and there would have been lots of life in the whole lot but they stood up and they, and they grabbed it and it's a strong tough hard struggle but you know what they struggle because they're Christ's and their struggle continues and they're going to continue and you just know by them no matter what goes against them they're going to keep on going because Christ is their savior he's their example and they're not going to give up and so back to Nehemiah he's got these Christ-like characters Characteristics, regardless of what part you have of your, in the life of the church. You could follow his example and you won't go far wrong. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who or what you are. It doesn't matter if you're top or if you're doing this or serving the tea or, or doing the prayer ministry or doing any, if you do anything at all. And you, look at our teams. I mean, you look at the organization that's after coming in here in the last, it's only two weeks old. But you know, God, God blessed us with a thought. And he put the thought into action. And it's working really well. And I was talking, we were talking at one of the leadership meetings only last week. And Nathan said it was the best Sunday he's ever had in church in a long, long time. Why? Because the burden was off him. And, and every week the burden would be there or he'd be doing something or looking around or whatever. And he said himself and Alice had made this determination in their hearts that they were going to go and sit down, relax, enjoy church and do nothing else. And they'd done that, and, and he said, it was a great week in church. He said, he really loved it. And that's because there's an organization now, that, and we're moving forward, every one of us together as a church, no matter what we do. And if you can't sign up for a team, it makes no difference. We see more people inside here that are in our team, and they're all helping out all the time. So it, it's not important. But just, just be sure of one thing. Be sure of your place. You're an equal part in this house. You're an equal part of God's family. You're no better and you're no worse than anyone else. And I don't care what's happened yesterday. And you're only one prayer away from salvation. So don't ever forget that, folks. And keep it in your heart and soul. God listens to you as much as he listens to anyone else inside here. He wants you. He loves you. We know what he's done for us. I mean, it's, it's an old story. But it's so important. He sent a precious, a sinless saviour to die on a cross. And he was cut to shreds. And his blood was poured out so that all who would believe in the name of Jesus Christ would find salvation. That's what he's done for us. 
It's as simple as that and as complicated as that. And we can listen to all the whispers you like inside in your head or what Satan wants to throw at you or to drive you away from the church or to drive you away from this or to, to, to discard things. You can do it if you like. But at the end of the day, he's done it all. And he wants you to be part of it. It's an exciting world there. And we live on the best side of it. We live in a side where there's hope and there's light and there's unity and community and there's all of these things. Oh, there, there's nothing enough like that. I know I've seen it long enough. I, I know exactly what's out there. We all do. So look, we're, all, we're all living it. But it's, it's God's community. We're going to make the change. And if we don't, nobody will. And God wants to use us. He wants us to be a part of it. He wants us to get on with us. But he wants us to be walking with him. It's not a hard job. It's just a continuation of a relationship with God. That's what we have. We have to continue with him, to go to him, to trust him, and to love him. So in Matthew 11, verse 28 and 29, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me, as I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. And if I was just to conclude this morning, I'd like to give you a quote. And it's a quote by John Piper. And he said, Life is wasted if we do not grasp the glory of the cross. Cherish it for the treasure that is it, it is and cleave to it as the highest price of every pleasure and the deepest comfort in every pain. What was once foolishness to us, a crucified God, must become our wisdom and our power and our only boast in this world. That must sum us up. I think that's, that, I think that's appropriate. And I don't think we need to say any more after that, except that may God bless you and may he comfort you and may he lead you this week and may your heart's desire be only Christ. Let's get back to the task that was set before us. Let's bring Christ to our villages, our towns, our cities, our nation. As we, his children, his cherished, prized children, work together in unity and equality. We're, we're going to communion there later on. If you feel that you need prayer about anything, if you're here for the first time and you're not sure about Christ, come and talk to someone on the prayer team or talk to us afterwards, no problem. We'd love to explain it to you. It's what we do and it's what, it's what we love most and we love talking about most. I'll come and talk to us and we'll chat to you about it. But there's, there'll be two guys up there to be praying. And if you have any, any requests, go to them. Go to them. Prayer works. We all know it. I've seen it so many times in my own life. I know it works. God is good. God is faithful. May God bless you and protect you for the week. Amen.